Well, then double down on acceleration and double down on agility. What else are you going to do? Not do speed work? That's not really an option because speed is part of your story. How do you set yourself up in these small spaces for the most success for when you have the space? If you're an athlete or coach that knows speed work is important and you want to get faster, but you either A, work with a large number of athletes, B, have a small amount of space to work with, or C, have both of those things, those are valid concerns, but no excuse to not do speed work. Good thing I'm here to share my stories, lessons, and experiences of being a speed coach for three years of not only a large number of athletes, but also small spaces and everything in between. I'm here to share what I've done, what I've found success with, what doesn't work as well to help you do your speed work better. Watch this episode, listen to it all the way through to learn the tips, the tricks, the concepts, the drills, the examples, the lessons to help you better handle small spaces, large number of athletes, or a combination of those things to give you more effective speed sessions for your athletes and help you waste the opportunity to get faster by just avoiding it altogether. So let's get into it. But first, who the heck am I? I'm your host, Matt Tomatz, and I am here to help athletes and coaches take control of their sports story. There is a story you want to tell when it is all said and done, the dust has settled about sports. And let me guess, speed is a big factor and contributor that could take you there because that's what this is all about it's really not about the drills it's not about the number of athletes and getting hung up on that or not having all the equipment it is the story that you want to tell and this is the first step in helping you tell the story that you want to tell by maximizing your time in small spaces and maximizing working with longer groups so let's get into it all right so a little bit more qualification the things that i've done i've worked with 40 plus athletes and i've variety of different spaces and amounts of equipment. I've worked with high schoolers, multiple teams in just a gym, just five lanes of an indoor track in the weight room itself. I've had 40 plus athletes just in our facility itself, just using the weight room portion and then part of the turf. And I've had a bunch of athletes outside, whether it's a football field, whether it's a big turf soccer field from the park district. I've worked with Chicago public schools, hundred plus athletes. I met 10 minutes ago with three total coaches and just bands and cones as well as local high school football teams and a variety of equipment. Kind of like I said, I've had just me with these number of athletes. I've also had seven coaches at my disposal. If some of the sport coaches want to hop in. So although I do have my fair share of one-on-one clients, I also have plenty of experience with these types of groups and space amounts. So what am I going to go over in this episode? I'm going to share just an operational definition of speed training. What do we mean when we talk about getting faster, developing speed, just so we're all on the same page to create some context for this. And next, I'm going to talk kind of about the ideal speed training situation, because we have to know what the perfect scenario is. So consequently, we know what we're striving for, or the aspects that we're trying to hit. Next, how to handle large groups, how to maximize small spaces, how to do speed work that's not speed work, which is fantastic for both of these situations of large at- large number of athletes. I'm going to say large athletes a lot. You've been warned. If I say large athletes, I mean large number of athletes and small spaces. And last, I'm going to turn it into action. But as I go through this with the videos I'm showing, with the concepts and drills, if you have to pause and write stuff out, if you have to just pause and imagine your own space setting equipment, whatever it may be to help bring it full circle. This is just my situation, my experience, my lens, and you have to make it real for yourself. So whatever you have to do to help make it real for yourself, please do so. So speed development is an operational definition that my colleagues and I have created. Training of sprint mechanics, so shapes, patterns, and rhythms sprint mechanics, and maximizing force vectors. So it sounds a lot fancier than it is, but vector just means a magnitude and a direction. So we have to hit the ground and it hits us back. We have to maximize the amount of force and also the direction of the force. Maximizing force vectors across starting positions, acceleration, and transitioning to max velocity sprinting that leads to significant and measurable improvements in speed. And as we go through a speed training cycle, we have our skill acquisition. So just working on those foundations. Strength speed development. So we're adding some 
oomph to those things that we just developed and speed realization, we have to put it all together. So that's what I mean when I talk about speed training. So top speed. The ideal situation, you have to be sprinting at 95% or better of your best speed. So you do need space to get up to that speed, usually at least 30 yards plus D cell, D cell space. It has the step over pattern, vertical force component, and you got to be tall and bouncy and top speed. Acceleration, you have your projection, rhythm, and rise, projecting yourself forwards, the rhythm of decreasing ground contact times, increasing step length. You have to gradually rise and just get that pattern of slowly increasing your body angle. You got to have huge shapes. You got to hit a nice A position, even when you're leaning forwards and projecting. And you also have to gain ground, and actually move forwards. Agility. Well, you have the change of direction skills. We have our linear D cell. We have our unilateral cutting, bilateral cutting, multidirectional skills, curve running, shuffle, crossover, all of those things, those categories, change of direction. Now we have to make it true agility with the reaction component. So change of direction is the skill, the agility skills itself. And agility is putting it all together live. It's not pre-planned. You just have to do it in the moment. Sprinting. So that's the main component of speed. When we often say speed is linear speed, straight forwards. So step length and step frequency. And those are the two components that make up speed. And usually with small spaces, step length is the issue. But if we can still work on half of that equation, instead of giving up altogether step frequency, that's way better than doing nothing, just for example. And what's the technical model? So we have a kinogram here of a top speed sprint. We have a kinogram here of an acceleration. So if we have this technical model of what are we shooting for, even though if we do a drill that's not full speed, top speed, but it creates these positions, well, yes, we're still working on top speed, just not every component of it. And same for the acceleration right here. So we have a context, a definition of speed training. We have the main things for each type of speed, top speed, acceleration, and agility. And we also have this idea of a technical model. What are we shooting for? Can we replicate it? Can we get bits and pieces of, of com bits and pieces and components of it without doing the full thing? And the answer is yes. So large athletes, I have the definition retyped and I did not cross anything out because there is nothing you cannot do with large athletes relative to this definition of speed training, linear speed sprinting. However, often the largest, so this is assuming large athletes in enough space. The biggest limitation of working with large athletes is going to be equipment to have the funding, to get it all organized, to get it all sent up, it makes total sense. So everything in this technical model, in, in this definition, do you see that you have to have equipment? No. Do you have to have, I'm trying to repeat the same thing. No, you don't need equipment. Yes, it makes it nice, but there was fantastic speed coaches before people ever made a 10 sprint or before people ever made time lasers or before people ever even manufactured the big, rubber stretch bands, which I will get to later, which is my favorite piece of equipment. So large athletes, just the equipment component. So the biggest concern if we're doing all of our speed work regularly is minimizing athletes standing around. That is sport coaches biggest pet peeve. They want to minimize standing around. They want to work hard. They want to grind. Well, it's a facto guy. We are do or gal. We are doing speed work. It has to be high quality. And it's all, so we need to rest anyways for true speed work to hit those high percentages of our best. So how do we disguise it if we have these large number of athletes and simply just walk back? The general rule of thumb for rest is one minute rest for every 10 yards sprinted hard. So let's say you're doing 20 yard accelerations. You sprint through the 20, by the time you decelerate, you have, you go to the 30, the 35, 15 yards, so you're at the 35, if you specifically instruct your athletes to slowly walk back, by the time they get back, it'll be a minute, a minute and a half plus. You talk about, give another coaching cue, boom, there you go. There's your two minutes, two minutes for every 10 yards, 20 yards total. And I must say, you know, like let's say you have 40 athletes. By the time you have eight guys going or girls and you have five groups and they walk back, there's two minutes right there. You just have to be intentional on how you're coaching it. Now, that's not to say, hey, guys, I'm disguising our rest. 
It's just, hey, let's get after it. Just walk back slowly in between. We'll talk for 10 seconds, then we'll get on to our next rep. Sport coaches happy. Athletes feel like they're doing a lot, but you know that you're doing high-quality speed training. And I must say, as I've had my fair share of one-on-one clients, some under the age of 10, one-on-one, like, good thing I wear a watch on my wrist because getting that timed rest, feeling like the pace is super slow, you're not doing everything you can, it almost works better in partner sessions and groups of four because you almost have to rest because you have to let other people go. So if you're concerned about standing around, how do you disguise the rest? Because you need rest anyways. And next, how do you incorporate multiple athletes in one drill? If it's an agility drill, how can you get three people to go at once instead of one? Or how can you space it out to where multiple people are going? So that's another way just to increase the amount of people going to minimize the time standing around. Solutions. So waterfall starts. I have a video of this on the next slide where one athlete goes and then the next and then the next. So within one rep, everyone goes in what seems like all at the same time, even though they're staggering by about three, four seconds. And let's say you have 20 athletes. Well, that just took 40 seconds to a minute for everyone to go. And then you walk back. So waterfall starts are a great option. And also everyone five yards at a time. So this is one of the main things that we did when we had the 100 plus athletes with CPS, Chicago Public Schools, is you said, hey, O-line on the five yard line, D-line on the 10. We got our uh, DBs and receivers on the 15, et cetera, et cetera. And then everything was just 10 yards one way, 10 yards the other way. And everyone's going, it's all spaced out. They all have their space, whatever it may be. I also have a video of that. Complexes. So just because you're all doing speed work at the same time doesn't mean you have to be doing the same exact thing. So this is something that we would often do with our high school football teams over the summer. One group is doing speed work. Sorry, (laughs) we're all doing speed work. One group is doing top speed. One group is doing acceleration. One group is doing agility. So consequently, instead of all having to rest and wait and do the same thing, if you have the, the coach power, just recruit the sport coaches, give them the most simple drill, the most simple cues and things to work on, or just tell them, hey, here's the drill. Here's how you describe it. Keep the energy up. That's all you got to say. Then you're all doing more stuff. Or if it's top speed specifically, you have athletes doing a set of dribbles. You have an athlete running through wickets. And then you have athletes going through lasers. Walk in between each station, get two reps at each, and then we'll kind of rotate and go and let's get six total efforts in. Or if it's an acceleration complex, one group is doing horizontal med ball throws. One group is doing broad jumps, banded broad jumps. And one group is actually doing the accelerations. Now, if you have 10 kids doing each, that's 30 athletes, and they all feel like they're doing more. And, and I, I guess what this, which I should have stated earlier, is it's the feel. It's not actually, are we doing more? You could have all the kids do med ball throws. You could have all the kids do broad jumps. You could have all the kids do accelerations. But then it's more standing in time because you don't have as many, or more time standing around because you don't have as many med balls. You don't have as many bands for the broad jumps. So what feels like they're doing more? Because no one has to say, oh, well, you know what, coach? This was actually the same amount of work if we all went together. So I'm not bought in. No, it looks like you're doing more. It feels like you're doing more. These are just techniques to get those athletes and coaches bought in. So equipment is a bonus, but not a requirement. So like I said, it makes things a lot easier. You have more options, but these are some solutions that'll help you get that feel of a productive speed session with large groups. So here's an example. Even if you just have these cone disc things that, you know, it's, it's like narrow at the top, wide at the base. They're like maybe two, two, three inches off the ground. These simple cones, discs, can be line organizers and distance markers. They can be wickets for top speed. Wickets don't have to actually be little hurdles. They can be cones. They can be like pieces of tape or tennis balls, just something that your body's trying to get up and over. They can be boundaries for tag if you're doing agility. They can be line spacing for acceleration if you're trying to work on that gaining ground, increasing step length pattern of acceleration. They can be objects for pickup races, you know, like shuffle, grab a cone, shuffle, put it back, run, grab a cone, run, put it back, back pedal, grab a cone, back pedal, put it back. Or it could be uh, the targets for uh, change of direction races. So run, cut around the cone, cut around the cone, run back. So even just something as simple as that, there's so many options. You just have to get creative. And there was an example for top speed, agility, chain of direction, and acceleration just by using these little discs. But here's an example of some of the things that I talked about earlier. So this is every athlete 
going five yards at a time. Like I said, you just have some way of organizing them on the zero, the five, the 10, the 15, and say, all right, we're all going to go five yards towards half, or sorry, 10 yards at a time towards half field. All right. Once you get there, turn around. All right. Now we're all going to go 10 yards back towards the goal line. And it's a way that everyone is doing something. Everyone has their space so they don't feel all cramped. You don't, have to, you don't have to have everyone on the goal line and say, you 10, go. And then you wait 10 seconds. Next 10, go. I have done that. And for something like a warm-up, it works well because we're all getting warmed up and we're maximizing our time. Next, waterfall starts. So first kid goes, take off. Next kid goes, take off. Next kid goes, take off. You know, so there's three, four seconds in between and everyone is quote unquote doing the same rep or going at the same time, but it's not actually at the same time. So however long this video was, this video was 24 seconds to get, I had probably 10 or 12 athletes in that video in. So how, do, how does it feel like we're all going? How does it feel like we're all doing stuff without actually doing stuff? So by the time the first person finishes their rep and the last person is done with their rep and walks back, that first person has plenty of rest for whatever it is you're doing. Next, so just uh, tag, agility, races, things that you can have multiple athletes, oh, things that you can have multiple athletes going at once. So here's one rep of an acceleration chase tag, where one athlete is, we call us Fox and the Hound, one athlete is behind, trying to tag the person in front of them and the person in front is trying to make it a certain distance 10 yards without being tagged and this i don't even know how many kids i have here and they were younger too a very simple drill to explain everyone is laying on their stomach the person in back gets to decide whenever they want to run after i say ready person in front as soon as your partner behind you you see the move you get up and run 10 15 yards without being tagged so we're all doing a rep we all have to rest and we're all getting faster. And even with, uh, let's say I had 60, 60 athletes, right? So there's 30 groups of two. I could number them off and say, all right, groups one through uh, 15, one through 15, you guys are going first. Group 16 through 30, you guys are going next. So then even though you're waiting, well, there's only two groups that you have to wait for. You know, so there's different ways to be creative on maximizing your time with large athletes. So now let's maximize our time in small spaces. So I have the definition of speed training again, the, the training of sprint mechanics, shapes, patterns, and rhythms, check. You can do that in small spaces. Maximizing force vectors, check. You can do that in small spaces. Starting positions and acceleration, check. You can do that in small spaces. Transitioning to max velocity sprinting. I crossed that out. Can't really do that in small spaces. At least a significant and measurable improvements in speed. Check, you can measure speed in small spaces. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six components of our speed definition, and only one of them is crossed off in small spaces. And that's gonna be the major limitation is top speed and the ability to, you know, cause you didn't, you didn't have time to build up to your top speed. So knowing that that's something that we cannot do usually, well then double down on acceleration and double down on agility. What else are you gonna do? Not do speed work? That's not really an option because speed is part of your story. But next, how do you set yourself up in these small spaces for the most success for when you have the space? If you just wanna abandon top speed altogether, well, are you really gonna spend the first, and the first two weeks outside tr teaching the dribble series? the step over pattern of top speed work, or are you going to spend those first two weeks being outside, building up that, that capacity and yardage of top speed work? So on week three, you can start timing your fly tenths, as opposed to if you hadn't worked on that dribble series, well, you can't really start timing until week five, let's say, just to go with that example. So how do you maximize your time inside to set yourself up for the most success for when you do get outside or whatever it may be. So top speed, we have our shapes, patterns, and rhythms, the step over pattern, ver vertical force, tall and bouncy. We got our, our dribble series, single leg step overs, straight leg bounds and straight leg bounds. I think are an awesome option because they are a specific hamstring strengthening exercise in that leg straight 
ground contact, how we hit the ground, ground and top speed. So even if we have 10 yards of space, you can get three, four, five straight leg bounds in. You can do your dribble series, your single leg step overs. So you're strengthening the hamstrings in this leg straight position, and you're working on the step over pattern in only 10 yards of space. So there's things you can do. Yes, it could get a little dry and boring. Change the hand position. Put a stick on their shoulders. I'll give examples of this later. So top speed, the main thing is going to be the nervous system component being at 95% or better of your best. Yeah, that's frustrating. That might just be the thing that you have to take the L and eat it on. I'm not in your shoes, but if I could give a recommendation, if there's any possible way that you can get outside and do it safely, do it. The benefits of top speed sprinting greatly outweigh the, the inconveniences of it being a little bit cold or whatever it may be. Now, if it is putting your athletes in harm, obviously do not do that. But if it just takes some time to shovel some snow off the turf or whatever it may be, I think it is greatly worth your time to consider that. So here are some options. So we have our, our dribble series, and not to go through all of it, but this is just our, our ankle dribbles. Working on the step over pattern, that was ankle. You also have shin and knee. Getting up in front and down. We have a, a high knee, or I think it's ankle to high knee dribble with PVC on the shoulders. Or this is just, yeah, uh, five yards. So 10 yards of knee dribbles, five yards with the stick on the shoulders, and five yards where you pop it up. This is working on that vertical force, tall bouncy step over pattern, and then the added bonus of the stick taking away the arms. Next, we have our single leg step overs. Working this pattern just one leg at a time. And on this drill, we're, we're running out five or 10 yards. But this is what I have 12 athletes, which I know isn't that much. But I just got 12 athletes to work on the single leg step over pattern in a matter of this video is what, 12 seconds long just by having 10 hurdles. And this is one of those things. Also, you can just do this with discs and say, don't hit the disc and say, cue it to get the knee up as high as possible. Next, acceleration. So our shapes, patterns, shapes, patterns, rhythms, projection, rhythm, rise, eight positions, big shapes, gaining ground. You have your A series. If you just become a savage at A march, A skip, A run, A switch, skip, and you crush wall drills, well, it's better than doing nothing. It's better than saying, oh, not going to do speed work because I have a lot of athletes, or I'm not doing speed work because I have small spaces, or I'm not doing speed work because I have large number of athletes and small spaces. Next, bounding. Even if you have 10, 15 yards, just like the straight leg bounds, if you get, let's say, six bounds in, you hit five reps of that, or sorry, five rounds of that. Yes, that is, you know, five rounds can get a little bit monotonous, but what else are you going to do? You say, hey, hey, athletes, I know this isn't ideal, but give me your effort. We're going to maximize our time here and we will get faster. This is going to pay dividends in two months when we can go outside again. And I guess that this is something else is you can set the expectations and the context for your athletes as well by saying, I know this isn't ideal. I know we've done similar type stuff like this the last month, two months, whatever it may be, but this is going to pay off. This is going to make going outside that much easier. So bear with me. Give me your all. We're going to get faster. And I think you can't really complain if you set the scene like that. Now, if you, if you walk up to the speed session and go, hey, guys, like I know this sucks. You know, all we have is cones. Um, this is some boring stuff that we've just always been doing. Well, who's going to get amped up for that workout? So use expectations to your advantage and just be real with your athletes when you're describing it. Next, starting positions, check. Acceleration, check. Transitioning. Maybe you can't do that. You know, transitioning would be like yards 15 to 25, 30, something like that. Well, there's still two out of three types of acceleration that you can work on. And banded exercises, oh my gosh. The thickest bands that, you know, perform better or whoever it may be, the thickest bands that they offer, I don't know, the inches or the pounds, whatever, just the thickest ones. Even one or two where you can tie together, I think, is the most cost-effective and effective speed training exercise, or sorry, speed training equipment. And let me show some examples. So I've, like, I just love, so this is uh, two bands hooked around each other. One, one athlete holding them back and one athlete going. 
So everyone is, feels like they're doing something. Even if you're just standing still, you're not standing around, you're being the anchor for your partner. And I, and I cue it, I instruct it, Hey, be a good anchor, help your partner get better. Now, even if they're not super engaged, well, they're more engaged than just standing without the band around their waist. And then was that two, four, six, 12 athletes, uh, nine to 14 year olds. And we got a ton of speed work in. And then you can do these banded exercises moving forward. This is a sprint. Yeah. Banded sprint. I think this was heavy, quote unquote, heavy resistance. That's how I instructed the person behind. You need rest anyways. You're helping out your partner and you get to work on those components of acceleration. So we had our band resistance sprint, and then we had a laser right away. I had six athletes. We all did everything at the same time. But imagine if we had you two are, are just resting, catching your breath. You two are doing your banded sprints. You two are in the lasers. Well, everyone feels like they're doing something because they already know the importance of rest because I talk about it way too much. But we do get that equipment, that extra stimulus, even a contrast component because it's a complex. So that's the band moving or slash with the partner. And, and this is like super small spaces right here, an anchored band. So in this one, I have athletes being the anchor. You can just tie it to the bottom of a rack. You could tie it to whatever it is. So you can do your A series. So that's this video right here. A march, a skip, a run. This is an A run. You know, like even if you just have these big bands and you have a bunch of racks in the weight room, well, you can still do speed work. So if you just loop it around the rack itself. So that's a march, a skip, a run. We can do something like a one step. So sprinter stance one step as far as you can driving the hips and the knee and the chest forward and then next we have something a little bit more agility ish like a, a banded lateral one step this is a lateral quick to quick to stick so uh out and jump back in and then back out again you can do so this is this would be something more a little bit more lateral and you can do banded broad jumps so there is one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's like seven or eight exercises just being anchored to a band. You need like maybe five feet in front of you to do all of this stuff. So anchor banded exercises are just a double thick or just one thick. If you trust your athletes to hold it with their hands, I've just had a few too many horror stories of athletes letting go. So it works well putting it around their waist. But even if you just have one, just stress the importance of focusing and not letting go of the band, obviously. And you can get a ton of work in with like these bands, for example. Next, mechanics, shapes, patterns, rhythms. So we have our lateral one steps. We can do lateral bounding. We have our linear decel series, five yard cutting. Even if it's just five yards, regular cuts, unilateral pivot cuts and bilateral cuts. That's two types of cuts, five yards, seven yards, 10 yards. Tying that into the other types of, of agility. You can have shuffle to a cut backpedal to a cut, curve run to a cut. And then we have our categories, which I kind of went through, but linear decel, unilateral change of direction, bilateral change of direction, multi-direction and curve running. And then just any, any type of race that would be kind of pre-choreographed or pattern. And then with all those things, you can make it true agility with more athletes. So there's all these categories and I have all these drills that we don't need that much space to do. Now, can it be a full open field tackle? No, this isn't called open field speed training. This is called small space speed training. So there's these components that you would do in open field tackling, for example, that is going to set you up for way more success once you do have that open field. And here are some, some examples. So let, let's do some linear D cell. So this was just 10 yards to a... a Unilateral D cell, you can make that five yards. You can change the start. It can be reactive with a partner. You can do partner mirror drills. This is great. You need 10 yards of space. So you start at the five, you have from the zero to the 10. So 10 yards of boundary. Then you just have one person on offense, one person on defense. This, this is the shuffling example. You can do run, back pedal, shuffle, crossover, shuffle run, anything goes. This is true agility in small spaces 
using a partner, everyone's going at the same time, or you can do the, you know, if you have eight groups of two or three, well, one through four, you guys are going first, five through eight, you guys are going second. So that's an awesome drill that is engaging for athletes and doesn't need that much space as true agility. Next, we have our multi-directional hip, hip flip and return series. So this is just five yards. I had nine athletes here. Hip flip, run backwards, five yards, run back. Hip flip, crossover, run five yards, run back. You know, hip flip to shuffle, run back, whatever it may be. You could do this partner reaction. This is a, a four uh, a four cone partner reaction drill. This is a five by five square. I've done it with a four by four square. Cross over there, cross over return based on your partner. And so this would be the agility version because they're reacting off their partner. Or you could do this with the coach pointing their direction. You could do shuffle, one step, cross over. Next, tag. So tag is a great way. This would be true agility. I was just on a, a turf field, soccer and lacrosse. So I was just using the lines to my, no, no equipment. I'm just using my resources to where I think I had four, four athletes on quote unquote offense and five athletes on quote unquote defense. And I made it. So I was like, Hey, offense is going one at a time to make it um, a little bit more like mentally engaging of having to keep track of everyone on offense who has or hasn't gone yet. They were spread out all around the, the, the boundary. So there's, so it's not too taxing for the offense. Everyone on defense is doing something until they're tagged. And then everyone's going at once, you know, that's, what was it nine athletes doing one agility drill? And this is four athletes just using the small goalie circle of lacrosse. One person on offense, three person on defense, I can call this just circle tag, tag everyone, run back. That's when your time stops. Everyone's doing something. Everyone's going to need some rest anyways. And then we're all getting better and getting faster. This is line tag, just a classic variation. This, this is like 10 yards total, maybe 10 yards across, two athletes at a time. I think I had eight in this group. And by the time you walk, you watch a group or two groups go, you catch your breath, you're back up again. So this doesn't need that much space, but there's plenty of tag options that don't need that much space that is going to keep that that's engaged and having a great time doing it. So speed work, that's not speed work. So knowing that there are these qualities that make a sprinter fast or qualities that make someone faster, ankle stiffness, plyometrics, force vectors, right? Magnitude and direction. Well, how do we maximize and work on those without actually having space to run or a large number of athletes? So ankle stiffness, plyometrics, and doing that in all planes of movement. So sagittal, frontal, transverse, rotating front, back, side, side. And med ball exercise, whether it's vertical or horizontal, I don't have a slide on this, but that might be a little bit more jumping specific. If it's vertical, you could do broad jump, two feet, so horizontal focus, or you could do like a, a one-step sprinter stance forward throw. So that would be like working on a first step. So there's a pl plenty of options of speed work or speed qualities that's not speed work itself. So plyos, it could be something as simple as a depth jump, depth drop, however you, you call it. You know, all you need is just some boxes or... You could do what we call like boxes of death. It's just a, a random combination of cones and boxes where they just have to jump over, be bouncy, have rhythm, slowly walk back. It's engaging because I describe it as boxes of death, obviously. It changes every time you be creative. Everyone's going, right? By the time you walk back. So a great way to work on ankle stiffness, bounce, vertical force that isn't sprinting. And let's say you, you don't have big, big hurdles. Well, you just have discs and you just cue the athletes. Hey, go crazy. I want you to jump as high as you can. I don't care how high this disc is. I want you to get better curve running. So this is like a curve run and return. You know, you could even do this in less space. I just had a five yard lead in to add a, a little bit more of a D cell component to it. If you have a circle, so this is circle running, curve running. And I had four athletes going at the same time, trying to tag each other. Now, imagine how 
engaging this drill is versus just one person go do two laps around the circle. All right, next person, two laps around the circle or whatever it may be. This is just using, I do have cones, but this is just using the line on this mini soccer field, the, the center circle. And this is partner figure eight chase tag. I have a bunch of cones because I have that resource in my facility, but you just need four cones for each part of the figure eight. So seven or eight, and then just say, hey, run around it, don't get tagged, right? There's two athletes, it's a longer rep. Like I think one of these was what, eight seconds, seven, six, six, seven seconds. You're gonna need some rest after that anyways. So just an example of the different types of curve running. You have your quarter circle, half circle, full circle, figure eight. And then ankle stiffness slash hopping. So a little bit more unilateral than the boxes of death, which would be bilateral. But we just have kind of a uh, an Altus zigzag rudimentary hop series. So this has that frontal plane component to it. Bouncy rhythm, not just straightforward, working on the ankles. I, next, I call these count and compete line hops. So just all you need is a line. And you say, hey, as many as you can. I think we're going 20 seconds in this video. But hey, start at 10, recreate to 15, then go to 20. This is an awesome finisher. Even if you're just doing this, like the crack in between tiles in your weight room, you can end every speed session with counts and compete line hops to build that ankle stiffness, that ankle capacity. Now, 20 seconds was kind of a, a, a long time, but my high school high schoolers could handle it. Uh, on this one, we were going lateral. You can go linear. You can go two feet super, super fast and just build up that capacity of ankle stiffness. Now, this is, um, I don't even know how to describe this. This would be like a, a canyon bound zigzag one leg left, right, I guess. A lot harder than it looks. Components that aren't sprinting, but they're more athletic, balance, stiffness, unilateral, not straightforward. A lot of bang for buck with an exercise like this. And then in this next video, I had athletes bless their souls. When COVID first happened, we were outside on a like, park district hard clay basketball court thing the half the time like half it was only plowed there was salt sometimes not salt and this was ending the warm-up for our top speed focus day five one leg hops vertical focus one leg tuck jumps one leg whatever you want to call it those are harder than they sound and imagine if you get really, really good at those with appropriate volume, progressive overload, assuming your kids can actually handle it. These were high scores in this video. But a lot of things you can do to check that box of qualities of being faster, qualities of sprinting that are, are not sprinting itself. So lastly, action steps. So how do we turn this into action? So rewatch this again, send this to a buddy, subscribe to my YouTube, subscribe to TSP. I mean, those are just suggestions, but write out an entire list of everything that I did, every category, every component of speed. So we have our 95% for top speed, step over, vertical force, tall, bouncy. This is all off the top of my head. It's like I made this PowerPoint. Acceleration, projection, rhythm, rise, big shapes, A position, gaining ground. And then you have your categories of chain of direction, uni or linear, unilateral, chain of direction, unilateral cutting, bilateral cutting, multidirectional curve running, your shuffle crossover. And then not only that, COD, but you also have just making those same skills, true agility. And, and, there's, and then you also have your speed work that's not speed work. Like that's just a, a new category all in and of itself. The speed qualities. So there's so many things that you can do, whether it's finishing a warm up, whether it's ending a speed workout, whether it's the speed workout itself to work on speed that doesn't have to be actual full out sprinting or the long, long sprinting. And then if you have larger athletes, how do you have multiple lines of athletes all going at the same time? How do you incorporate multiple athletes in the same drill? There's these concepts and principles. You have what we're trying to work on, the technical model of speed. You have ways to do it with equipment, without equipment. You have ways to scale it for more athletes. You have ways to scale it down if you have small spaces. And there's ways to make it harder with equipment and there's ways just to do it with no equipment. 
And it's almost like a mix and match of what works for you, your situation, et cetera, et cetera. And try it for a week or two weeks. And if you like it, great. And if you don't, scratch it off your list. You know, like the counter compete line hops, that was a good exper- experiment. My athletes weren't that engaged with it. And I don't really do this anymore, but I'm glad that I did it and I learned it and I tried it. And now I know that, that that's an option. If I have zero space, if I'm in just a weight room, I have that tool in my back pocket now. And make your own. There was so many combinations of waterfall starts, agility, types of agility and change of direction. The, the speed that's not speed that I just haven't mixed and matched together yet because I haven't had to, but maybe you will. So speed work for small space slash large groups is just as much a skill as it is for big space slash small groups. Now, I'm pretty good at big space, small groups, because that's what I do on a daily basis. But because I have that ideal perfect situation, I have all of the options at my disposal. So now I know how to cut back, tweak, modify. I just have a bunch of tools in my pocket to make it happen. So hopefully that helps. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, at Coach Big Toe. Hit me up if you have any questions. Just shoot me a DM. I'm here for you coaches and athletes that want to make speed part of your story. Hope you enjoyed. Have fun getting faster.